Yes, we can. Uh, good evening to all and a warm welcome to all of you. So at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Vikram Datta, uh, President NQCN, and Dr. Vijay Garwal from CAHO for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session. And uh, NQCN has been a quality-focused organization working persistently to improve the healthcare outcomes across India. And uh, this aligns well with our CAHO objectives. And I'm extremely happy that CAHO and NQCN are together today to bring out this webinar. And I feel very privileged to be part of it. And uh, I am Dr. Anuradha Pishmani, uh, the Joint Secretary of CAHO. To introduce CAHO to the new participants in this webinar, CAHO is the consortium of all the accredited healthcare organizations. And it is a not-for-profit organization and includes all the NABH and the NABL certified and accredited organizations. And uh, CAHO's unique idea is about uh, bringing all these quality hospitals and laboratories under one platform uh, to improve this journey of uh, quality uh, has been very successful. And CAHO strength lies in its uh, wide reach of its various training programs, what we have for various uh, professionals. Which, uh, which include the doctors, nurses, quality professionals, and uh, paramedical workers. And it includes both the public and the private domains across India. And CAHO also liaises and works closely with various international bodies like the ISQA, the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, and the Asian Society for Quality in Healthcare, the ASQA. And also we have the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, the IHI. And within India, CAHO has been working with various government medical colleges now, through the Directorate of Medical Education and also with the various medical universities. And we have been imparting customized training on healthcare quality improvement. Today's webinar is the first webinar we are doing along with NQOCN. And to introduce NQOCN to CAHO participants, NQOCN is Nationwide Quality of Care Network. And uh, this is also a not-for-profit organization and uh, NQOCN has been partnering with, uh, with the government uh, to mentor all the Lakshya facilities and have, they have been taking up various training programs and mentoring them so as to improve the facilities and the, uh, improve the quality standards in the labor rooms. Again, under Laksha guidelines, one of the important component is ensuring a respectful maternal care to our pregnant women. And to implement this, we need to have better communication in our healthcare settings. And of specific interest and connect to the theme of today's webinar, we have uh, two of our CAHOS modules which are very close to this uh, communication programs. One is the enhanced clinical communication, which we do design for the doctors. And we have a one day nursing communication module for the nurses also. And coming to today's scenario, we need to improve our patient safety in our hospitals. And uh, for this, it's extremely important for us to be conscious of the communication which is happening during the course of care to our patients. And uh, more so now in the midst of this global pandemic, things have got a bit more challenging now. And uh, today uh, we have uh, two of the eminent doctors who are going to share their perspectives on handling these challenges. And I'll just share my screen to introduce them. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. And our first speaker is Dr. Sanjeev Singh. He is the Chief Medical Superintendent of Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center at Cochin, Kerala. He is also the Lead Project and Operations uh, uh, New Upcoming Facility at Faridabad. And he is a pediatrician by training. He has done his Master's in Hospital Management, a PhD in uh, Infection Prevention and Control. And he has been the past Regional Coordinator at WHO India Disease Project, Education Project. He has been an Improvement Advisor at IHI and he is a faculty at IIM Calcutta and at Bangalore. He has, uh, various, uh, he has received various awards, which includes the Best Quality Initiative Award by the DL Shaw. And uh, we have with us our second speaker, Dr. Kingsley Robert Nyanadure. He is the Deputy Chief of Medical Services at Bangalore Baptist Hospital at Karnataka. He has done his UG and his MD from Christian Medical College, Vellu. He has uh, done his MBA Hospital Administration and postgraduate diploma in medical law and ethics. And uh, he has a wide uh, variety of experience. He has been a senior resident at a tertiary care hospital and a medical superintendent for two rural mission hospitals. And he has uh, experience in setting up an ICU upgrading ex uh, emergency department and various fundra fundraising requirements of leprosy center and a community hospital. 
and uh, he's been one of the first healthcare communication trainers from india and is the author of the book communicate care and cure also and he has various publications to his credit and uh, he has received the semi excellence award for the development of emergency medicine and uh, i am dr anuradha pichmani i am the joint secretary of uh, kaho and i am a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist from tamil nadu i am a ispa expert and a nbh assessor and now a qa mentor at nqcm2 and i am very happy to be moderating this session with dr vikram datta who is the president of nqcm to introduce dr datta to our participants he is the professor and director at the department of neonatology at kalavathi charan children's hospital and the lady hardinge medical college at new delhi and he is an ispa expert he has been actively involved in the conceptualization launch and propagation of quality improvement across india he is a technical resource group lead for lakshya a member of the qed working group and member of the national mentoring group for lakshya and he has been an editor for various journals and he has various publications to his credit and uh, he has authored two textbooks in the field of neonatology and pediatrics i welcome all of you to this uh, sessions and uh, so the schedule for this webinar will be the first session will be handled by dr sanjeev singh which will be on the health healthcare worker patient communications during this pandemic the various challenges and opportunities and the second session will be handled by dr kingsley robert robert yanadurai and uh, he will be giving us some examples and case studies on the paradigm shift in this communications and uh, finally we'll have the q and a session which will be handled by dr vikram datta and uh, i'd also like to thank dr bani singh dr rahul garde and the team from ncocn for helping us doing this q and a session so all of you can put up your questions in the chat box which is available and uh, i now hand over the floor to dr vikram datta to proceed further along with this webinar thank you thank you dr anuradha so i will just bear with me for a moment till i share my screen and take you briefly across the activities of nqc in india for for some of our members who would not be aware of the activities of nqc in india the i bring, bring greetings to you from the nationwide quality of care network and i thank kaho our partner organization for giving us an opportunity to be a part of this august a webinar today evening with a eminent panel of experts who would be sharing their insights on the communication process which is very vital to the health worker communication especially in this pandemic era so as you can see our organization is a relatively young organization we founded in august 2017 and our online presence is on qoc.net.in our journey started in 2015 from lady harding medical college my alma mater that is where i work as a director of neonatology services and we started in the year 2018 by the formation of a quality improvement cell and starting to do some improvement at the level of the public sector hospitals of the country which very rapidly evolved into a nationwide quality of care network a network of facilities across 12 states of india well i am proud to share here with my august audience that we are lead partners to government of india for the lakshya national mentoring and our logo found, finds a place of pride in the national health portal of government of india well we started nqcn like i said formally in 2017 the story can be accessed in greater detail in the indian pediatrics 2018 september issue we are a voluntary network of like minded professionals with the vision of empowering healthcare professionals to continually improve quality of care across india and the map on the left shows our presence across india as of march 2020 our core competencies well we have some unique core competencies the most important of them is that we are a unique innovative quality of care network with grassroots level presence across india our membership base extends not only into the private sector but also into the private public sector settings we have strong relations with professional organizations and today's webinar is symbolic gesture in that direction and we work in an unexplored area of quality of care improvement in a low and middle income country setting and that is what is innovative and important from our perspective well our improvement philosophy is that we want the right staff in able to deliver the right care in the right way at the right time and this is been the process with which we continue to deliver the quality improvement process through active stakeholder engagement learning and capacity building on site mentoring 
measurement of data quality and flow and with the active involvement of community at all levels our areas of engagements and operations extend right from pre service education into medical and nursing undergraduate students to in service students nurses doctors professional organizations we work very closely with nhm organizations of various states and which are depicted on the slide we work with frontline health workers uh, we have the unique distinction of working very closely with the asha facilitators and asha workers in the state of maharashtra like i mentioned before we are the technical partners to government of india we have been conducting multiple webinars for the global quality equity and dignity work, uh, network for isqa southeast asia and the global learning lab we trained more than 3500 doctors and nurses and health professionals exclusively into quality improvement using the point of care quality improvement methodology and we are actively working in 130 health facilities ranging from phc to medical colleges to corporate hospitals and we have one of the largest pool of national coaches and mentors in quality improvement which consists of more than 240 uh, national coaches and one very important uh, part of our network is a young professional network that is mentoring the leaders of tomorrow and this is called the be the change network which has been globally acclaimed by who and this is a, a network of young professional medical and nursing students who are working together to crusade for quality improvement revolution in india in covid era we've been conducting multiple webinars which are streaming live on youtube we have had the chance to develop a hub and spoke model which is currently in the process of publication in bmj open we are also working very closely with in service uh, pre service nursing colleges across uh, uttar pradesh madhya pradesh and various niti aayog aspirational districts of madhya pradesh we have been working with the milk banks in rajasthan state quality improvement across the north and south kerala along with nhm kerala and development of a quality of care model using qa and qi balancing skills in the state of meghalaya so basically it all started with a quality improvement work in uh, lady harding medical college and right now skipping through it's published in the british medical journal these are some of our publications uh, we've been uh, you know sharing it extensively on the social media platforms various newspapers including the prestigious hindu newspaper where uh, we've shared the story and how quality improvement works we work together with organizations to develop qi enhanced resource materials because just developing resource materials our philosophy is doesn't make any difference so we make that qi enhanced resource materials and as you can see on the screen we got the largest pool of nurse qi mentors in india we launched a innovative on site mentoring program across the district hospitals the medical colleges undergraduate medical and nursing students with the frontline health workers the asha workers like i was just mentioning we are supplementing it with offsite remote mentoring partnering with community in developing quality improvement projects that is the expanded quality improvement aim statements in place in service quality improvement education programs partnering with state nhms partnering with uh, uh, the indian army and i am proud to share here the photograph with uh, uh, lieutenant general madhuri kanitkar and this is one of the photographs when we were doing a similar course for armed forces medical services in afmc pune and our like i mentioned previously partnership with government of india we are proud to be partnering with the multitude of organizations in india and kaho is amongst one of them and it occupies the center stage uh, who are contributing to the quality improvement movement in india so with this i and i invite all of you to come and join the qi movement for more details you could consult our website and i am going to be stopping the sharing of my screen and i am now going to be handing over the mic to the uh, the stage and the screen to very eminent speaker dr sanjeev dr sanjeev is going to be taking us forward into the communication webinar formally so dr sanjeev the stage and the screen is all yours sir thank you thank you dr vikram i think that was an amazing journey i <clears throat> somehow we uh, missed uh, your path and uh, the work which you have done in nqocn with 350 3500 trainers 130 uh, facility 250 coaches very impressive journey of be the change for youngsters i think you are doing a fantastic job and uh, we really salute you to bring in the 
quality improvement in both public, private, and covering all sectors. So, congratulations to you and to your team. So, uh, the job today was communication in times of COVID. Uh, at, as you know, it's uh, unprecedented times, difficult. And uh, what I'm going to cover is uh, what are, what would be the core learning uh, communication skills. Uh, I acknowledge uh, Dr. Kingsley because uh, he is our communication expert and we have been uh, attending his sessions for last decade. And uh, Dr. Charu is my wife who has attended Dr. Kingsley's session and also takes a lot of communication. But I don't know how our uh, home communication is, but uh, she definitely uh, does take a lot of communication classes. And she. <clears throat> so... Uh, this is what Buckman had said, we will never meet everyone's expectation. And that's very true. We cannot be 100 by 100, but the skill and effort we put in uh, to our clinical communication does make an indelible impression on our patients. And uh, it, it is very true because uh, uh, my wife was admitted uh, post ERCP pancreatitis in one of the government facilities here in the way back in 25 years. And it was a very traumatic journey for us. What we remember is the fantastic uh, interpersonal, interprofessional collaboration and communication, especially from the nursing staff. And I'm very, very fond of them, though we almost lost her. She was six months in an intensive care unit. But what the, the memories which we cherish is fantastic communication, especially from the nursing staff. And they, they did so well, uh, their families and friends. So if you do it badly, they may never forgive us. So if you do it well, they will never forget us and like uh, we do remember our difficult times. Uh, COVID is definitely a humanitarian crisis because it is just not the healthcare, the, it's an infrastructure facility, it is logistics, it is the behavioral change, it is uh, almost everything. What we wanted is somebody, a very uh, charming, uh, a good smile uh, doctor, always available, but what we have is all covered. And uh, according to ICMR, they, the categorization is mild, moderate, and severe. Mild and moderate, they are all done, uh, treated at home. Unfortunately, what is available uh, for communication is uh, moderate and severe, which would be either in HDUs or in ICUs. So the communication, again, is extremely, extremely challenging. So we, it, it's very difficult to maintain that uh, expressions, which speaks a lot. Uh, JAMA had published that uh, we as a physician do interrupt uh, the patient's story every 23 seconds and that's pretty bad. 50% of the time we don't, uh, we don't include patient's history in our communication. We don't uh, also inform, uh, we take less than one minute to spend on the prescription and we did a home uh, survey with our pharma pharmacy college student and we realized that 76% of them of them were not taking medicines appropriately. So uh, despite the fact that we are in a literate state uh, and we and the, there's a white collar syndrome, we intimidate. So uh, if the patients do want to ask a lot of questions, but uh, somehow they get intimidated by and, and they forget. So improving communication, trust, and co-design is important. This is the work which we are doing with UK and South Africa. This is part of antibiotic stewardship. But uh, this is an ethnography and a, and a uh, project called a sociogram. So we observe uh, people there. So this is a very hierarchical, though we think that we are uh, doing very well at Amrita, this is again a very hierarchical way of working. So there is a senior surgeon who takes a lot of information from the carer and very uh, limited information from the patient. And his most of the information comes from the surgical resident and all the other team members who are there, associate assistant professors are mute spectators. And the other communication which happens is the nurse who is uh, standing. So there is a Western concept of having a patient centric hospital, but um, in India, it is definitely also a carer centric hospital, which is important. And how we are using sociogram, we take this uh, to, uh, to every physician, we track, we train, uh, and then we, take it for a behavioral change. And we say that this is how you have responded because training, training, training doesn't help. Training along with a behavioral change has an impact. So what are the core communication skills where we can have uh, an impactful uh, association with the patient? So sympathy is something where we feel sorry. Uh, empathy is actually knowing where the shoe pinches and that is where we need to be uh, very, very cordial with the patient, howsoever is the disease condition. 
and compassion is the desire of removing that suffering and that is the key so we need to be a very compassionate empathetic healthcare worker and this is again a very fantastic word positive regard for the patient because we need to respect uh, those patients we need to have non judgmental values and we need to deliver care despite any economic or religious bias and it would be important like if if you say that uh, you because you smoke you have lung cancer so it you don't give those judgmental values because you you, you respect and you regard uh, their behavioral pattern honesty and confidentiality is definitely a key because uh, you don't hide information from the patient uh, or from the family members but how do we empower during this uh, critical time how do we empower patients uh, we generally offer a lot of buffet you can do this you can do that but do are we helping them to take that decision because we can say if it would have been my father or my relative i would have taken this decision so can we empower them and uh, help them to take that decision listening to the patient is extremely extremely important because it is his or her story during the history taking which we uh, which we see uh the environment is again very very <clears throat> important and we and dr kingsley will speak more about it the privacy sitting down providing that kind of a comfort eye level and this is my wife who uh, i took her uh, almost 3 weeks back to one of the facility because she had some uh, uh, back ache and uh, covid time is a difficult time so she was seen in a corridor because uh, the corridor has that 1 meter distance the rooms were all full the visitors were not allowed and then she has an n95 mask where she the voice was muffled and then the uh, the, the the associate consultant at that hospital also has a mask and a visor so how do you listen to those communications it is going it is very 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 difficult very challenging nevertheless i think the the non verbal and verbal would uh, play a big role avoiding interruption mobile phones are a big big interruption because when the patient is telling their story and if there is a mobile rings and you pick it up uh, there is uh, the, the patient definitely gets disheartened because there was a lot of emotions into his or her uh, physical or uh, systemic complaints which he, he or she was narrating which got interrupted and that is where the communication level breaks so non verbal communication is the 70% of uh, the communication and para verbal 20% so extremely important is listening which i think we, we are talking about covid times uh, how we need to maintain those communication this is the bit which we can still do and uh, we need to listen to the, because there is huge anxiety huge depression huge panic and very uh, real Uh, but we can listen to them how do we respond to those uh, non verbal communicate we need to maintain that eye contact is going to be difficult but whatever is uh, possible the posture keep nodding from time to time when the patient is giving that history uh, touch may be uh, may be very difficult very challenging during covid times because uh, you need to Uh, maintain those infection prevention uh, protocols this is the university of san diego one of the rooms which i took that photograph because everything which is communicated to the patient is written down so there are no communication errors there as who is going to take care what are the active complaints what are the patient contact number and what are their question and answers and comments patient's question and what was the goal of care and it is all written in the patient rooms so it's transparent it's honest and there are no errors tone and pace of the voice is extremely important and uh, like uh, if my, if i come late which i generally do in my home and if my was, wife ask you are so late coming home and you could have uh, at least informed me that the tone is going to be important and uh, if i just say that you didn't inform and you you were coming late that plays a huge uh, role in in uh, in communication verbal is just 10% so that is why listening and non verbal is so so very important which we can still maintain during the covid time greeting them when uh, when we visit their room or in, into the ward that i am dr so and so and i have been going to i am going to take care of you i am i am nurse for this particular shift and if they you have any concerns kindly uh, come up to me uh, using simple language open communications is important in medical field avoiding medical jargon is also very is the key i remember this is uh, uh, there is uh, just on a lighter note there was a 
a request which was sent by a gastro medicine doctor for an MRI to to uh, to radiation oncology, and uh, there was this um, on the requisition form it was written APD WGOO. And the, the consultant radiologist asked, what does this mean? And he said, it's a aseptic disease with gastric outlet obstruction and you don't know, we need to get an MRI. So he wrote, he uh, sent back the patient and it was written MOO. And the gastro medicine doctor asked again, what does this MOO means? And the radiologist said, it's machine out of order. And we play with medical jargons, unfortunately, within, the, within our day-to-day uh, -day affairs. And that would be very, very critical. Avoiding premature reassurance, and this is what I would like to really stress, because we give unnecessary, because we don't know how to communicate and how to break uh, bad news, we give hope. We have asked for an MRI, we have changed an antibiotic, we'll see it in 48 hours. We don't want to break that bad news and or, or spend time with the patient. That's why we keep giving uh, reassurance and hope, and that would be also critical. Uh, some other uh, skills would be taking up some of the verbal cues when the patient is telling his story and uh, if, he, if he or she mentions, I was very worried and I couldn't sleep yesterday, but uh, I was also having nausea and vomiting. What we generally tend to do is take physical or systemic complaints immediately. So we'll treat nausea and vomiting and we will not get into why the patient was worried or uh, could not sleep the last night. Or we would be judgmental to say, let's get a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist also see him or her. We need to validate their feelings, which they have been uh, uh, mentioning. And anxiety and fear is a very, very valid feeling during COVID times. And so we need not downplay or ridicule that. They would mention huge number of complaints. It would be appropriate to summarize. They had pain, they had discomfort, they had nausea, they had head they had uh, retching. You need to summarize. You mentioned all of this, and uh, so and prioritize that. Yes, maybe pain is uh, one of those which uh, requires your attention. And this is what we also saw when uh, my wife was admitted. Ten times the patient complains, but uh, the bystanders always feel very difficult to reach out to the nursing staff. So it is only five, seven times they would listen to the patient if they have complaints and. From bystanders, when it goes to the nursing staff, nursing also, the staff also would li not like to address every time. And when it goes to the doctor, it is very, very difficult. So 10 out of 2 or 1 is, is, is the phenomena which happens. So we need to create an environment or a culture where uh, the, the bystanders or the attendants or the patient can reach out to the doctors. So doctor-patient relationship is key. The doctor will see you. I can't promise that he's going to talk to you, but he'll definitely see you. And uh, that is where I think uh, we need to change that ethos within the hospital that there needs to be a time spent, non-hurried communication, and uh, because that would improve everything, the patient compliance, satisfaction, team compliance, safety, less litigation, and communicating everything about the patient, systemic and uh, diagnostic accuracy. Very many times the communication fails when their bill is served. And uh, that is where there is mistrust, litigation, and then there are bad reputation. And But then there are solutions to those because we need not live with it. There could be daily billing, there could be regular SMS alerts, there could be honest package information, there could be consent when you brief the patient or the bystanders. You can take a sign off, you can uh, explain the services which are being provided on a regular basis. So there are ways and means, but then you need to walk that extra path, which is extremely important. Now, Kubler-Ross had given this five stages of grief toward coronavirus. And every time it happens like this, whenever there is information which comes and there are emotional response. So first is denial, because you got COVID positive. There is a denial. Why me? May not, it may not be true. It could be negative. And then we look for that information. Yes, 30% of the RT-PCR uh, is false negative. So maybe we fall under that. There is anger because then you're looking for beds and beds are not available and you cannot get admitted. Then you bargain. You look for some information uh, and maybe I don't fall under the severe category or fall on the moderate. There is depression which happens and, and some it takes time to accept that. So everybody would follow this, uh, this route 
some some of them would be keen to accept that but it is it is fair and wise for every patient to go through this five step process uh during the covid time uh, we generally would say co they would have a minimal symptoms and they need not take any treatment at all do not assume because it would be advisable to speak out all <clears throat> what is required for them to be uh, to be ready uh don't forget for the human touch it was important but uh, may not be in, in in indian circumstances it would be so different it could be male to male or female to female it could be otherwise it It, it may not be appropriate but what was uh, in a kerala model other than the electronic surveillance other, other than empowering of uh, kudumbashrees and asha workers other than getting all positive on the social media and uh, identifying primary and secondary contacts first what was good was leadership because 30th january first case declared public emergency and was, there was daily briefing so that's a fantastic way to keep communicating and engaging with the Uh, people so ptsd pandemic is also around the corner because of covid so it would be nice as a healthcare worker we need to have a routine we need to do all of this you would know but what is extremely important is have a healthy team relationship because if you reach out if you if you are vulnerable it is also even if you are a, a male uh, doctor and you are vulnerable and you are expressing your vulnerability during this covid time it is courageous so reach out to your uh, team members and then they need to sort of take care i was also asked to uh, talk about this doctor nurse communication and i have a different uh, uh, take on this and i i drew this just to explain this so there is a pediatric cardiologist why there is a gap in nursing uh, doctor nursing communication so a pediatric cardiologist did his did it mbbs he did his uh, md he did it dm from names he did a fellowship from boston he got his experience at the premier hospital he became head of department then he became a national faculty then he became an international faculty he performed extremely well in education and research and that's the growth which happens for the pediatric cardiologist and simultaneously what how does the nurse grow so she does a bsc graduation and then she looks for a job then she gets recruited she gets really blasted when she gets uh, an hr interview she is very cautious she is joyous she uh, gets a joining letter she comes to work there is hardly any proper orientation if there are 70000 hospital at least 6000 doesn't have a good orientation program immediately because there is a requirement in icu she is placed in an icu and there are beeps there are monitors there are alarms and there is uh, deaths which are happening and that is where she is butchered and battered so how do you how does this nurse fulfills the experience of a pediatric cardiologist who's who is so very well trained and expectation is so very high and that is where the communication breaks and this is my last slide so to maintain that good communication i think ra own positive regard should not be there for the patient it is extremely important to be non judgmental empowering the nursing staff because they need to participate in your care interprofessional communication and collaboration is the buzzword ipc because it's no longer a single member team it is and this happens in our setup where pediatric cardiologist pediatric cardiac surgeon intensivist anesthetist and uh, the msw the dietitian the nurse all of them take one round so that there is no communication failure and the and the patient is important and the nurse also needs to go through a specialized certificate courses which would be important and then there should be regular meeting this is a university of uh, michigan who has this kind of a board where they put every bit of graphs uh, after the rounds they come and they do a unit meeting here and they also have a fantastic uh, area where they can put an idea of improving things uh, with respect to patient care so there is an idea they are doing it and if it is done and then they celebrate the success and that is how you bring in a cohesiveness and working together thank you very much for the patient listening thank you dr radhata for uh, fantastic work you are doing and dr anuradha for giving us this opportunity thank you so much uh, dr sanjeev for that lucid presentation i think the last word was something which is absolutely captivating and i think that's the mantra for all the teams in india right now to follow and that's an a development of an excellent nurse doctor relationship 
like you showed the career graph of the doctor which is moving up scale the career graph and the motivation levels and the, both the intrinsic as well as the extrinsic motivations and the psychological safety for the nurses often do not follow that course so very rightly said sir that especially in the covid era and especially in the uh, stressful times it's very important to have good team dynamics and the nurses morale and the communication level needs to be very high so thank you so much uh, the please stay back with us for the question and answer session and now i have the pleasure of inviting dr kinsley we've been waiting uh, for sir's presentation so dr kinsley the uh, stage is all yours now yeah dr kinsley please it's a pleasure to be here on this forum and uh, i would like to thank kaho and uh, the nq Museum for giving this opportunity, and it's a wonderful stage that you have set for me, Dr. Sanjeev, that you have put in together all the principles of communication and a present situation how we are dealing with it. So my platform is quite set, and I will go straight into the topic. So COVID has really taken all our thoughts for the last four, five months fully. So I don't think we are spending enough time thinking about anything else other than COVID. is it going to buy a grocery which we have been doing only recently eating everyday meal everything is about covid and seeing patients is quite an angst so the physical toll that has happened with covid is quite a lot so put a picture of how the physical distancing is happening the same way if you look at these pictures like uh, the patient with their mask their face cloth and the healthcare worker in a full suit so if this is going to be difficult the distance and the quality of physical examination how much of reassurance that actually could happen with this so a patient who has come will have a mask on the doctor has a mask or a respirator a visor and on top of it the distance and the gloves are going to be there too and in between you have cleaning processes and other things happening so there's a huge amount of physical constraints which are there in the first place and this itself is quite intimidating and this is one thing we have to realize so i think our quality department was very happy when they audited hand washing nowadays because everybody is using the sanitizer right from the patient to the doctor the sanitizer use has gone up so much i think it's good that we are utilizing something but that is a physical discomfort which has come into the overall thing of how we are handling it so this is one of the most important challenge that we are facing and for a pediatric patient it becomes even more difficult because chill things and the parent with this is the physical environment which is actually a big problem and in india most of the opds nowadays they have uh, stopped all the air conditioning so with all of these things going on it becomes even more uncomfortable physically to be there to see so that adds to the issues and many fever clinics are makeshift structures and the ambient areas and other things become even more problematic for them and it is difficult to hear them and just to see this picture in the emergency we had a situation one patient in our hospital actually complained saying that nobody saw us as a doctor I'm like what do you mean no doctor saw i don't know who is the doctor the nurse the nursing aide there the attendant who is walking around inside the er helping and the doctor everybody looks like this so how do i know who is the doctor so this identifying role is something people take for granted because if you look at it generally introducing self and identifying who you are speaking with has become very very important now because with these additional layers we need to be very sure who we are for the patient right 
So patients sometimes may not know that it is the doctor or the nurse who is talking to them. They might think this is just because physical exam touch examination is very limited. Most of the time people come in, clean the room and go, and they also come in a suit. So it's difficult to know who exactly is the healthcare worker as a doctor, nurse, a lab tech, because all of us go in a complete suit. So a simple thing of identifying roles. So it's as simple as putting a plaster with your name, if it's a doctor, nurse, so that they know who they are interacting with. This is something which we learned because what the, it became a patient complaint because patients said nobody saw us. So it made us realize the first two days of wearing this, we have to be sure that we put ourselves a sticker to at least identify who we are. Because verbally, even when we say, they are not able to hear correctly. So being that much louder, clearer becomes a problem. So a simple sticker to say who you are or some way to mark who you are makes a lot of difference when it comes to identifying the role that you're playing. The psychological toll is the next component. Healthcare psychological, that's what I would talk first because as a healthcare worker, we are also very vulnerable in the present situation. I'll have to think when I go home, what happens to my elders at home? What happens to the small ones at home? Am I going to take infection back? So that's going to be on my head. So if I have an emergency surgery going in, the anesthetist is worried. Or if a patient comes from a red zone in active labor, the whole labor room is worried. So there's a lot of anxiety. Are we going to get infected? And that is going to be a major strain. And this is going to be the psychology, very, very heavy thing that's going on in our head. And when we ourselves are not sure how we are handling our emotion, we actually have to face patients who come with even much, much more anxiety. They have their wildest thoughts and they have some patients have come to the OPD with just saying, I know one of my relatives who traveled from US three months back. They had a cough yesterday when I was talking to them on the phone. Do you think I should be concerned? I like you spoke on the phone, right? Did you go and meet? No, but uh, we are doing calls together. So they are so anxious and these things are very trivial for us because this is not something we need to be worried about because we are seeing dying and living and this is so trivial. So our mental state and the emotional state of the patient, when we are able to handle our emotions is when we can handle the emotions of the patients better because they are more and more worried and we need to address that in the right way. So this is a typical situation that people respond so differently in a high stress. So typically what they say, it is fight, flight, and you have the freeze, right? Some people don't know what to do and they freeze. So that's the in-between of the both. So most common one is flight. So escapist attitudes and we, as healthcare workers tend to turf the problem or ignore the problem. That's our escapist. So that's how it works. Or if we are frightened that we would not even be there in that situation. And for the patient, their mind is numb. When they are stressed, they can be so anxious. They may not even listen to what we are reassuring them with because they just want to talk and express their worries and their concerns and they just keep talking and if and we on the other end are trying to reassure them and there's not going to be a clear-cut balance over here so what we need to do is keep our messages short simple and many a time we have to repeat it more than once and it is very common for people under stress to focus more on the negatives like when we explain about covid we tell that 80% don't even have to come to the hospital and only 20% land up in the hospital for whatever and 3% to 5% may land up in the ICU. So their fear would be, am I going to the ICU? Because that's how they look at it. And that's how the psychology is going to work here. 
So we need to look at how we balance because we cannot reassure in a very empty manner. We need to reassure in a manner which is appropriate and positive. So typically three positive messages to one negative message so that we can balance it. Even in the best of this, you will have in an ICU communication, we typically talk, right? Patient is on a ventilator, his BP is low. We are giving medicines to bring up the BP and we are giving antibiotics to fight the infection. We need to watch how he is doing for the next day or so. And the next question the patient will say, attenders will say, so you're saying he's going to be okay, right? So everything is not to be worried. So sometimes they just don't want to listen to the situation. So this is what, how you're handling, you're in denial, you don't want to agree to it. So as a healthcare professional, we need to be aware that the patient is going to have their own ways of dealing with it. But there's a huge onus on us. It's like how you would bounce a ball. If you bounce a ball on an uneven surface, it's not going to come up back to you the right way. It's going to bounce up too high or it's going to bounce too low. As a healthcare professional, it's our responsibility to make sure how the patient and the attenders handle it. So we need to make that extra effort. So how are we emotionally in a situation to handle it? So we need to be aware of our emotions to handle things better because that's the most important thing in our present COVID situation. So uh, some tips to see how we can do it in a present situation. So most importantly, be present. That is, how are you? Are you okay in seeing a COVID positive patient or a suspect COVID positive? Are you in an emotionally fine state? Because you yourself are not in a fine situation. Your interaction with the patient is going to be very, very difficult. Not just that, if you have any anxiety that you might be taking infection back home, you're going to be very worried about it. So make sure that you're present. And most thing about, as I said before, once again, make introductions. Identify who you are and identify who you're speaking with. Because many a time, patients, attenders are not at the bedside nowadays. Because we don't want attenders right next. In COVID situation, they're isolated. And if you're going to speak to an attender, it's typically over phone. And you need to be sure that you're speaking with the right person, right? You may have more than one Kamala in the same ward. So these are basic things. Patient identifier has to happen. Otherwise, you might be declaring the wrong news to the wrong person. So make sure your introduction and your identifications are correct. And the typical thing about next thing is identifying patient needs. So in a family medicine setup, what they typically look at it is, ideas, concerns, expectations. Okay. okay, the eyes. So this is what would be very important when you're dealing with a patient's needs. So identifying that is very important. As Dr. Sanjeev had already said, oh, asking open-ended questions and clarifying it and, and listening. And listening not just to what they are speaking, but the emotion. Because that's the most important thing about reaching to the patient and meeting their expectation. Most of us, when we are asked, are you in pain? How are you doing? Simple question. How are you doing? We reflexively will say fine before we tell no, I actually am having a headache. Same thing for a post-op patient. If you're doing going rounds and asking the patient, how are you doing? They'll say fine. Then only they'll talk about their other problems. So if we stop with just saying fine, we will miss it. As a nurse, if you are going to the bedside to ask, are you in pain? Uh, and if they don't actually say, say that verbally, but non-verbally, you can see it on their face, the pain, and you ignore it. That wouldn't be appropriate, right? So listening is not just of the words. It is of the emotions also. We need to listen to the emotions so that we can respond better and our expressions of that would be much easier if our interruptions is less. And when we respond, we respond to the emotion 
And if we have validated the emotion, we have demonstrated empathy. And demonstrating empathy is the most important thing. And if we do that, it makes it so much easier of a barrier that we have overcome. And finally, share information which is clear, concise. So short bites of information so that the patient can always come back with more questions to clarify. This makes it easier when you're looking at how to connect with the patient and take this forward. How do we do that? Nonverbal is fully out, right? Because you're in full clothes. If you're looking at a jumpsuit with the hood on top, you're literally not gonna have much exposed. But remember, between those layers, you still have your eyes. And it takes a little longer to actually lock those eyes with the patient's eyes. And when we lock those eyes together, the smile which is hidden behind the mask actually is visible for the patient. Okay, so remember eye contact is very important. And yes, with the visor, goggles on and a hood on top, the refraction is a problem, but, and the misting. But if you can lock those eyes of your eyes to the patient, it will mean that you have broken most of your barriers. You could reach out much better when eye contact is established. So how do we talk with the patient? So check in how they feel. Ask about their COVID because many a time people are anxious. They don't want to say it. Like I told you the OPD patient visits, they come and they ask so many things. You really don't understand why they made it to the hospital and for what. And you ask, are you worried about COVID? Yes, I thought I may have COVID. And it becomes so much easier. So check in on them. Ask about the COVID. And there are issues. If you have a person with a COVID positive, a lot of anxieties are there. So if it is an adult who has COVID positive, they are worried about what happens to the rest of the family, their primary contacts, are they going to be isolated? How is the quarantine going to work? Elderly are worried. Am I going to die? Am I going to go on a ventilator? Now everybody is talking about ventilator. So people know what's a ventilator. So these are things which we need to lay it out and we need to motivate them to talk about them because that is the first time they are going to be even thinking and when you put those things in their head, they can think about it and express it. And there's going to be a huge lot of emotions when they are going to throw it out. They may cry, they may scream, they may be silent, they may go numb, not knowing how to react. So there's going to be a lot of emotion. And as healthcare professionals, we can handle physical things as a told. Emotions, we are not at all comfortable. If somebody is crying in front of us, we literally don't know what to do. We look up, we look down, and nowadays mobile. We look at our mobile, we don't know what to do. So when there is an emotion, that's something very difficult to handle. And all these things needs to be recorded somewhere. Because nowadays we work on shifts. You have either one day duty and so many days off or you work for one week and you're off for one week or you're doing two weeks and you're off two weeks. So many various things and people don't know whether these discussions were done and what was actually spoken and what was decided. So it's good to record these discussions and have them also. So we can communicate in a better manner, reach out to the patients and have this as a plan for the next team to also take it forward. Just put this picture to see. Look at what's happening in an IC. The patient is so critically ill, is on non-invasive, probably went on to an invasive ventilation later. But how do we communicate to these people? There's been a lot of communication aids which are there. So you have a tab, you have laminated charts with pictures on them. You can show them, you can use that to communicate. So those are various things which are available, which we could use and they do help. And in a team like this, did you realize that the doctor, the respiratory therapist, the nurse, all of them are there. 
and they are also going to be difficult hearing each other. The patient most likely is sedated or if they are elderly, will have their own hearing issues. I don't know what they will hear if it's so much alarms and things beeping around them. So these are all very anxious moments. The crisis communication, which are most often protocolized, becomes and comes under major strain here. And the communication between the team is extremely important here because if the team communication is not good, it's going to affect our patient care. And this is not a problem when you have standard protocols on how to do it. Especially with the suit on, it is as simple as to say, am I holding it right? If you ask the other person, we'll have to just signal that's good enough. So our communication, we need to innovate in this situation to make sure people hear you, see you and can listen to understand you better. And we are discussing COVID and as we come here, our platform itself changes. The communication skills which I've been doing in the last, in this last decade, what I realized was classroom based. It was more of interaction, me walking around and doing things. Now I'm doing it on a digital platform. I'm doing it as a webinar here. Same thing happens to our patient consultation also. We are moved to telehealth hmm, where we have a lot of telemedicine and that's how it's become a norm. And we are doing a lot of patient and patient family interaction over phone. Not just phone, there's WhatsApp, Zoom and so many other things. Various proxy decision makings are happening through this digital me medium. So we are continuously innovating, modifying ourselves the way we communicate. But the crux of the matter is still the same. Human to human interaction and understanding that emotion. And when we connect with that emotion, we reach out much better. And this is not a simple thing if you are not prepared. So it's always good to rehearse in your mind what you want to talk to the patient when you're interacting. There are a lot of standard questions most people ask. In a COVID situation, how do I get it? Will I give it to my family? What will happen to them? What will happen to me? There are various scenarios and it's good to have standard answers for it. And it's good as a team, everybody speaks the same answers so that it's much easier for the whole team to be as one unit and we are speaking the same language which the patient can understand. Here, each vernacular is different and the way your patient clientele is going to be different. You can modify it according to that. So a scripted format makes it much easier to communicate in these situations. So I just put forward a few of what I felt was the most important issues with COVID when it comes to healthcare worker to patient communication. But this is not just a simple thing because in India, it's not the patient, it's the patient party as such. And it becomes more and more complex when we are in this pandemic part where we are not following the usual stuff. We are so used to having the patient attender at the bedside. Now we are not having them. And it is even more difficult to work in this place. And yes, we are evolving, we are innovating, and these skills are gonna be important for us to move this forward. So over to our moderator and we'll keep things open for our questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vinsley, for that excellent uh, session. I think the best part which I liked, sir, is that the preparedness, the emotional connect and the human to human connection which is very, very important. Behind those uh, PPE suits, behind those visors, I think the eyes are still open and the communication mostly, like mentioned by uh, Dr. Sanjeev also, 70% is non-verbal. So I think that's the essence of an essential communication process. So the doctor and the patient communication needs to be of utmost importance using the principles which you have very beautifully and very lucidly interacted sir I, it was a tremendous learning for me also uh, listening uh, to you 
speak so well on this and i think my teams uh, who are connected on the facebook as well as in the zoom platform could be a tremendous learning for them so we will uh, if dr anuradha permits us we will now move to the question and answer session ma'am there are some questions which have come up uh, from the participants yes sir we can start yeah. off the session yeah okay so that should be fine uh, so the first question um, i will be uh, requesting uh, first uh, dr sanjeev dr sanjeev there is a question from giri v uh, giri asks that is there a, a template for doctors to align during the patient communication something that can be used as a reference maybe like a checklist or something so Uh, dr sanjeev you have to unmute yourself first so there are many checklists which are there i think uh, what would be very important what dr kingsley was mentioning is uh, this verbal non verbal and para verbal thing but uh, template one very very common template which is used is s bar so uh, where you can put in the situation background assessment and recommendation so that you don't miss and every time because every nurse or every resident would create an emergency so was there an emergency what was the situation what was the background when you did do an assessment and it has to have a finish point of recommendation so as far as a good checklist and there is one uh, which was published in pediatrics uh, which is also very popular is ipass i p a s s where you can also have an illness severity a patient uh, summary and what are the action items what is the situation awareness and synthesis by the receiver so these are the two checklists which are uh, very common uh, other than the clinical handover if there is a checklist with respect to that between doctor to doctor and uh, nurse to nurse okay thank you so much dr sanjeev i think in pediatrics uh, especially in the nest courses also in uh, bangalore we've been using uh, with the nhs system the s bar for the routine handover processes in our nicu so that's something which can be adapted for use in the covid time so i think that's a very good suggestion it's pretty simple to adopt in one unit uh, the next question uh, dr sandeep if you uh, if you could just stay on is from vaishali vaishali says that if patient load is very high in government hospitals how is it possible to expect such kind of communication which is the ideal communication apart from the training which we uh, are other ways to make uh, effective communication so she means that uh, there's a training and there are lots of ideal things which are told but if the government hospital and that's a routine question like how can we have quality if we have such a high patient load in government hospitals and how could now we have communication and more so in times of covid sir if the load is very high so dr vaishali if you can just forgive me for taking giving this example Uh, the, uh in amrita we have a very uh, uh, fantastic uh, pediatric cardiologist so he is uh, a very reputed pediatric cardiologist he has the maximum number of opds he does the maximum number of classes he does maximum number of research he does maximum number of publication and rest of the team we are 840 people 40 faculty and resident doctors in amrita institute everybody says they are busy the most busiest does the fantastic work because it is just the division of the time and creating that kind of a culture so i'm i'm not uh, belittling uh, this point i think it's very important in the, in wherever you have a a very busy program what best can be done is to create a team so if you have create if you mentioned this and possibly they have not gathered enough because the time was not there so the same information is passed on to the resident doctor because it was a team briefing then same information passed on to the nurse same information is passed on to the medical social worker so then there is no gap in communication so creating a team would be important but i would also like to urge that uh, the busiest of the person delivers the best of the work Okay, thank you so much, Doctor Sanjeev. One just... question uh, before I move to Doctor Kinsley. Uh, there are many questions, so I, I will be coming back to you, sir. The last question for you, and uh, at this point, is uh, 
uh, questions related to is there a digital platform available for patients and family counseling uh, including virtual goodbyes so we've been seeing a lot of uh, virtual goodbyes and, and they are very emotional and sensitive issue but uh, like in my icu also the other day we had a patient who was born to a covid positive mother and the baby was pretty sick and i asked my dm residents whether we uh, you know uh, had a video call with the family because they had not even seen the child and the mother was in icu well none of my residents had probably done it so the sensitization level in india is pretty low for it so sir, any digital platform or any process and what would be your advice to our doctors and nurses for critically sick patients so um, i may not be the right person maybe kingsley can chip in because i don't know if there are digital platform but what is very good is that uh, board of governors now have come up with those uh, the telemedicine guidelines so anything like whatsapp instagram videos can also be used that is valid legal to communicate video text and uh, messages are now uh, legal to communicate so you can use any of the platform whichever is familiar and whichever is handy uh, with the patient and the bystanders also Okay, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev. So uh, I next move to Dr. Kinsley. Dr. Kinsley, the question is from Hema Bhushan Rao. It's related to the previous question: How to handle misinterpretation uh, slash misunderstanding slash blame of patients relatives at the time of breaking bad news, oblique the situation of patient uh, deteriorating in the current pandemic? I would focus on that. So how to handle misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and this is a breakdown in communication. Like in Delhi, sir, we are seeing the patient is already diseased, and you know the news is getting out uh, to the relatives after a couple of days, maybe three days, four days, and sometimes this is creating a lot of uh, you know issues for the hospital, including medical legal problems. So how to handle that, sir? So the breakdown of communication is actually quite a significant problem because. you are right now dealing with how to uh redeem yourself from a situation but in any kind of there are two issues one is breaking the bad news second thing is how to handle a conflict because there's a misunderstanding there so breaking a bad news is where you're going to need uh preparing the patient preparing yourself and then make in sure you perform it the right way of breaking the bad news and then have a plan and a palliate through so that would be similar to the spikes protocol which is used for breaking bad news but when it comes to the other spectrum of handling a conflict situation typically first thing is we need to make the other party listen to you so handling that is the most important thing how do we make somebody who's angry upset listen to you so first and foremost would be allowing them to talk understanding the emotion behind it and many a time when you validate the emotion a person who's screaming at 10 may come down to something like 6 so you may actually get an opportunity to tell your side otherwise you never get a chance to actually tell your side you are only fighting and there's no winning game in a fight when it comes to patient party and the healthcare worker there's only a lose lose situation there so we need to look at how we can bring them at a level where we can first communicate talk to them so one of the thing is acknowledging their emotion you look very angry or you look very upset yes i am very upset because i have not heard anything about the patient or they told me he is alive and he is now dead so that's there's going to be a lot of yes i'll be also upset but if you sit i can explain to you if they are in a mode to sit you can proceed forward communicate but many a time if it is a bill related issue a finance matter or they are trying to leverage something out of you you're really not going to get any headway by doing all this gentle smooth talk it wouldn't help but if it's a genuine miscommunication which has happened you could bring down and really establish because then there is a rapport there which gets developed so one of the important thing is it's good to have the familiar face to do the talking so that they know i know this person from before that means you also interact with the familiar face that is the patient party 
and good to talk in a familiar language for them because india is a place of multiple languages and it is a point of a major sore issue if you talk the wrong language at the wrong state by the wrong person it can create a lot of problems so those are two things which would really help and then acknowledge the emotion bring them down and then proceed with explaining your side and then help in moving forward so that is what would help in a conflict situation but there is no simple formula when there is a hidden agenda there from the patient side thank you so much dr ginsley uh, there is a question from pratibha parera pratibha wants to ask especially we know that in covid times most of the patients getting into the icus and critically sick areas are the elderly and the vulnerable patients so she says that communication with an old uh, patient is very difficult they have speech issues and also deafness i think both the speakers have already covered on that so i am planning how to improve something like this in a, uh, in my setting so can you just give some tips to pratibha sir so typically in this kind of situation uh, cards are useful like a flash cards you can have various cards of common things on it you can point on it that helps them to also respond yes no questions with these cards would be easier and this is very useful if the patient is able to do that but on a ventilator on sedation that wouldn't be possible but otherwise this would be easier for them with pictures they can communicate so there is uh, not just simple things in nhs uh, in uk there is actually a person who has written on 72 or 75 different topics you can discuss with the patient starting from how's the weather so they made cardex like this and you can actually communicate by just pointing and showing this on a tab and touching so there are various innovations which we can do so it's how we look at it at that point and if somebody lacks a hearing device because they are isolated please make sure they get it otherwise it's going to be more difficult to communicate they are refraction glasses so when they come to the hospital many of these things are not brought and the rest of the family is isolated so who's going to bring them that is where the problem is because they have come they tested and they got into the hospital there's no time to say i'll go home and bring my things so no glasses no hearing aid so if you have a prior mechanism where you you're calling somebody in it is good to help them know that please bring all these things also as a standard protocol because nowadays test is done and people are actually going home also in when they are in mild symptoms or asymptomatic testing for contacts all these things are happening so when you have to call them in check or pull them into the hospital for further thing then you can actually have an opportunity to let them know but otherwise when they land up you can look use these cards and use that to communicate i think that's a wonderful suggestion so that can form the basis of a quality improvement project also and i think most of the nkc and team uh, teams uh, listening to you i think that's a wonderful idea communicating and improving the communication with the elderly both in the routine as well as in the covid times so that brings me to a couple of questions which i want to pose to both of you and these would be the last ones uh from uh, my own side sir and uh, i think we've been discussing about them uh, lately in lady arding metal college and also uh, amongst our teams so considering and this is about intra team communication sir i think we've been uh, discussing this <clears throat> also we've been so far uh, discussing about the team and the patient communication or the community communication so what is your comment about uh, the specific mechanisms of improving intra team communication and then i'll pose the same question for a add on to dr sanjeev also so intra team communication is uh, the crux of quality of your care right now so if there is a gap in it it's going to be a major problem so everybody has an important role to play so if you are looking at a uh, intensive care unit it is going to be a doctor with the nurse physiotherapist and various other members of the team and together every rounds every planning if they are doing and concerns are raised right there it becomes a problem easier way to handle when we are looking at home care 
the nurse becomes the most important person because she is going to be the one who's going to tell these are the issues at home these are the problems which we need to come back with so the team leader changes with the place and the communication as a team typically needs to be both written as well as verbal and that is a way where we can avoid issues and in a covid situation i would recommend to involve a patient party also so that what is communicated is always documented and their clarity of understanding is also part of the loop so that there is a continuity on decision making throughout which is also going on here thank you so much uh, dr kinsley uh, dr sanjeev any add ons on that yeah it's so It impressive to impressive to hear dr kingsley amazing it's uh, it's a fantastic learning i think uh, getting the team together if if we can get the ego down between everybody i think that would be the best approach and uh, we have something called as uh, bioethics committee clinical ethics committee so if there are any uh, length of uh, if the patient have stayed more than 5 days or if there are any disputes with respect to anything everybody comes in so the surgeon the physician the intensivist uh, the medical social worker the nurse they all come in they discuss first and come to a logical conclusion of one statement because the problem is the multiple people give multiple the neurologist gives his bit of it and he will say something called as lockdown syndrome and that's the end of it and then the other person will say no no there is a chance uh, for his recovery will go the other person the intense the palliative care will say no there are no chances so if every if uh, like if there is a norm that more than 3 days or 5 days there is a multi, multi uh, department of uh, meeting which will happen and there is one voice and then bring in as dr kinsley was mentioning the the bystander so that they are all there in the picture and they get very impressed because all seniors are spending time explaining it to them and addressing their uh, queries Dr Sanjeev before I let you go and this is the last part of uh, my session with uh, both of you and I am um, actively learning myself sir so that uh, the question is uh, what about the element of psychological safety you know sir uh, right now there are lots of observations and both of you very rightly pointed out that the nurses form the front line of any uh, you know team not only in terms of uh, the management as well as the communication aspects also so often it has been seen and that is nqcn's observation and also my personal observation there are lots of issues and i think it will make sense to my nursing teams who are here that uh, uh, there are lots of issues with the nurses pick up in terms of patient safety administrative protocols infection control practices biomedical waste management practices etc in the facility which they are you know hesitant to bring it to the you know the notice of the higher up in the authorities who could very quickly fix these issues and they need a via media to communicate with the higher authorities because that element of psychological safety is uh, still not fully established so you are the chief medical superintendent of aims kochi sir the highest uh, um, official uh, at that uh, point so from your perspective suppose you have something like this going on and you have some nurses and this issue has been brought to you how as a head of the institution you would encourage would you encourage a direct reporting from the nurse to you or you would you uh, let it move through a particular process i <clears throat> i am very fond of nursing staff because i find them the most obedient healthcare worker in the health uh, within the facility you tell them <clears throat> and then they do it so the only thing is why they don't report is because they have reported an occupational exposure once they reported it twice they reported it thrice and then they have gotten a feeling that nothing happens in this institute <clears throat> and they live with that feeling so until unless when they report like in our hospital we have a morning uh, meeting where uh, previous night discussions happen with the nursing uh, supervisors of the of uh, the night duty and the resident doctors and the facility people they come in so the issues are raised that this is what happened you have to address it <clears throat> and bring it back you have to close that loop bring it back to the nursing staff because you addressed it in the morning we have closed it so once they feel that yes they are they are escalating it 
and then there is a response there there is where they build in that confidence and i think that would be the the closing of the loop and building that confidence is important second important thing is that unit meeting because a lot of times the uh, the nursing staff especially the kerala nursing staff they are very timid very meek they don't want to speak out but they are fantastic people they do their job so allowing them to speak out in a unit meeting because when they are with the nursing staff and one or two people creating an environment they in a unit meeting uh, over a cup of tea they speak up they say that this went wrong this is good and this is what it uh, can be also improved so i think this is what uh, would be my simplest thing Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, uh, Dr. Ginsley, the last part before I hand it over to Dr. Anuradha. I know we are extending our time, uh, but definitely, Dr. Ginsley, uh, from your experience, uh, communication plays a vital role in not only establishing uh, teams dynamic effectively when patient interfaces during a pandemic-like situation, but sir, now we are grappling with restarting or continuing with routine RMNC HA services. which have been seriously hit all across the country and that's government of india perspective also and we've been discussing it in nqc and right through a series of you know webinars like this with international experts national experts etc so the main issue right now which plagues us is that's very difficult to reestablish the connect with the state district hospital teams the primary health center teams the two things sir the first thing is that they are genuinely you know busy and there is a element of physical and psychological safety issues which are there in their minds and the second is that they also have uh, you know they have a excuse i would say that's a bad word to say but for the teams which were not performing too well you know the covid is a remarkable you know excuse not to communicate and share their improvement data or to go ahead with the improvement project with government of india very rightly wants to restart and wants to continue and deliver effective anc pnc care and improvement processes so so what is your suggestion how to you know develop that uh, communication with the peripheral teams so that the routine rmn cha services are restarted with good or optimal quality of care and this is the last question and then we have dr anuradha dr vikram this is a very very difficult question <laughs> to answer because we are talking about non covid activity in the middle of a pandemic and right now focusing on non covid activities is as important as focusing on covid or more to say in a very short while it will become more important than focusing on covid activities because we need to get the future fixed and if we don't do our non covid activities the future is going to be worse than what we are now so yes we need to focus on the non covid activities but how do we get it done so one of the thing is there needs to be a clear cut workforce handling this because most common excuse is how many things you want me to juggle i am doing this i am doing that i cannot do all things on one point so it's going to be a difficult thing and policy makers need to look at that how they can handle it second thing is we need to look at how to bring normalcy in the workforce people need to understand and need to cope living with covid because covid is here and i don't think it's going to go away in the next at least not till the end of this year or so so we need to learn how to cope handling covid and then we need to look at how we can motivate our workers to understand the importance of non covid activities and enthusiastically get back to what they were doing earlier so this is going to be a lot of work because motivating remotely not at their level is not an easy <coughs> task and for that we need to understand their difficulties and then we can address it in a manner which is appropriate for them to be more receptive and if we can reach out to that i think we will succeed because the work is not new but getting them back on track is the most difficult part and if we achieve that we have succeeded in it 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kinsley. I think those were the words uh, which would be very reassuring for us, though it's pretty challenging and we are grappling with the issues and I'm sure the CAHO teams must also be grappling with these issues, re-establishing the routine services. And that's something which is very, very important. And communication, sir, as both of you would agree, plays a very important role in this process. And remote communication, like you just said, is uh, something which is pretty difficult. But of course, uh, uh, it has to be, uh, we have to use the best of our communication skills and connect and the human connect as well as the emotions and a mix of what Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Kinsley just shared with us. So it's been a privilege to be co-hosting uh, this webinar with both of you and in the August company of Dr. Anuradha and under the banner of Kaho India. I hand over the stage now and the screen to Dr. Anuradha for the concluding comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjeev, and thank you so much, Dr. Kinsley, from our side. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. It's a pleasure. So uh, it's been a very interesting session. Uh, and uh, we have been receiving various comments from the participants that uh, they have found it very useful. And uh, I would like to thank the speakers, basically, for making it so interesting. Because it's been a great learning experience. And uh, communication is very important, more so in this era because we have many litigations because of a breakdown of communication. And uh, in that way, this has been a very huge learning experience. And uh, this has been a very enlightening collaboration between CAHO and uh, NPOCN. And um, again, uh, on behalf of CAHO and Dr. Vijay Garwal, our president, I would like to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Singh and Dr. Kingsley, and Dr. Vikram Datta and the team from NPOCN. And we will definitely hope to take it forward and continue this collaboration in a better way so as to improve the quality of uh, healthcare settings. Thank you so much. Good night. I know Kaho, but Dr. Vikram, you have been doing a fantastic work. So continue to do the good work. Thank you, much, Thank you very much. Meeting you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's an awesome work that we did today. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you Dr. Kingston. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.